Hey there. Glad to have you all with us today. I'm Christy Iacomini with Prime Movers Lab. I'm the VP of Engineering and we're hosting a webinar on supply chain. Uh, I want to thank everybody for joining. It looks like everybody's still clicking in. Uh, we've got folks, uh, our founders, uh, some of our investors, a uh, special welcome to our new folks joining the family. Uh, if you are not familiar with Prime Movers Lab, we are a venture capital firm that invests in hard tech, deep tech, not necessarily software, all software platforms, that sort of thing. Uh, that puts us on the leading edge of looking at technology across several sectors. We look at agriculture, energy, infrastructure, transportation, human augmentation, and manufacturing, which is part of our focus today. Um, we do webinars every couple of weeks. We try to do them every couple of weeks in a, in a way to share what we're learning and to continue to learn. We invite experts and founders, those prime movers that are transforming the industries for us to talk to us and educate us about what they think are the, the new innovations and problems that they're trying to solve. We very much encourage this to be a discussion and hope that you include any questions that you might have for the panelists or us in the chat or the Q&A, and, and certainly any comments. I will write a little recap blog and I wanna include your thoughts if you think there's something that maybe we're missing. So we look forward to that input as well. Uh, and just for a plug, uh, our next webinar will be April 13th. It's gonna be Clean Energy in the Mining Problem, uh, hosted by Alessandro Levy. So with that, I'm gonna turn it over to my co-moderator, Brian Baugh. He'll introduce the topic in our panel. Hi, I'm, I'm Brian. I'm the head of manufacturing here at Prime Movers Lab. Um, I appreciate everybody joining us for the supply chain. I'm sure everybody's been watching the news over the last couple of years with all the shortages and delivery delays, everything from boats getting stuck to COVID challenges to even now we're having some war in Europe that's uh, causing some bottlenecks and trying times. Um, today, we're looking forward out into understanding what are some of the solutions that will um, dissipate some of these bottlenecks and also understanding why and where we need to advance the technology to help all of us in the future. Um, I, we're going to dive into this with the three experts we have on this panel, looking particularly at areas of packaging, cargo transport, and the food supply chain. And with that, I would, I'd love to introduce our panelists. I'll start with Alice Marie. Uh, thank you, Brian. I'm Alice Marie Jeffreyone. I am the president of packaging for DHL's North American operations. I have been with the organization for about 10 years, but I've been within the industry for over 25 years. Um, I currently live in Columbus, Ohio. That is where DHL's headquarters are in North America. And I live there with my husband and four children. And I'm super excited to be a part of this panel today. Awesome. Thanks, Alice Marie. We're excited to have you part of this panel also. Um, next up, we'll, we'll talk to Alexi. Hello, everyone. My name is Alexei Matyshev. I'm the CEO and co-founder of Nautilus. Um, my background is in aerospace engineering for over a decade. Um, we started uh, Nautilus in 2016 to help tackle uh, the rising cost of air freight. So today we design, build, and sell large-scale remotely powered aircraft drones. Um, ranging from the size of a small aviation airplane to something the size of a Boeing 777. Awesome. Thanks, Alexi. And congratulations uh, are in order for your, your, the birth of your son. Thank um, you. Last but not least, Pete. Thanks, Brian. I'm Pete Oberly, uh, managing partner at Trailhead Capital, where we focus on investing in early stage regenerative ag tech and food tech companies, which we truly believe present the greatest potential for improving human and planetary health. Broadly defined to us, regenerative means improving soil health, either directly or indirectly. And related to that, we think the supply chain presents a massive potential in terms of the potential to eliminate waste and improve food quality therefore improving human health and planetary health. Thus far, we have invested in 14 companies spanning on-farm opportunities, opportunities that are in the supply chain, and then companies that are at the consumer end. And we are working on wrapping up, raising a $50 million fund. Excellent. Thanks, Pete. Well, why don't we uh, jump into it? Um, let's kind of define the, the problem and where we want to go. Um, yeah. Yeah, yeah, it's a complicated space. Uh, we, 
uh, could talk about a whole range of things. Obviously, we only had time for three people to have a, 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 an um, informative discussion. Uh, we think of um, uh, supply chain as kind of two buckets. One is uh, the classic sense, if you will, uh, trucking, shipping, the, the, the transport of cargo, air uh, cargo. And then the other is sort of the the more uh, complicated relationship that a company might have with their network in trying to produce a product, uh, getting raw materials, getting components, and then uh, doing warehouse uh, and inventory management automation, and then getting it on the dock and to the customer, again, using that classic system. Uh, so there's lots of places that we can dive into. Um, we're only gonna maybe touch on three of those, and I hope we can, um, focus out a little bit as you all interface with other parts of it as well as we feel comfortable talking about it. So let's just start real quickly. We're gonna do uh, around, the, around the Zoom here. Um, I'd like for you to describe briefly your interface with the supply chain. We all heard like what you do and who you work for. Talk, a little, talk to us a little bit more about what, how, how the specifics of your supply chain engagement and maybe we can understand a little bit more about how you all might interact uh, with the things you do. And that'll give us some context as we hear more about your thoughts throughout the rest of this hour. So, um, Alexi, why don't we start with you? Sure, so uh, the, the products that we developed, uh, they're part of the transportation bucket that you mentioned, uh, specifically uh, focused on the middle mile delivery. Um, obviously, air freights, we all kind of understand how that works, but uh, we compete directly with rail, ocean, and as well as trucking um, on air freight. Um, so, yeah, it's, it's kind of a, you know, the challenges that we're having, especially in, you know, in, in the world today, it's kind of interesting to see these modes of transportation kind of revitalize as far as, uh, you know, looking at trucking versus air freight, ocean versus air freight, instead of ocean versus ocean or trucking versus trucking. Alice Murray. Yes, so you guys probably know DHL is a transport organization. So that is part of what we do, but within DHL, I'm part of DHL supply chain. And the core focus for that is on actual warehousing and distribution of products. And as a piece of that, I actually focus on the packaging of products. So what that means is I manage the demand planning, the sourcing and purchasing of packaging materials that um, our organization then packages. So that could be primary, secondary, or tertiary packaging of products. So as examples, we do bagging for customers, right? So we bag candy, we do bundling, we do display filling. So when you walk into a store and you see some of those displays with products in it, that is coming from our facilities where we've, we've done all of that in the facility and then shipped it out to the store. So any type of postponement or customization activity that you can think of about a product is something that we would do in our facilities so that as an end customer, you would be seeing a new product, a new SKU that was created at the end of that process. Wonderful, thank you. And then Pete, let's hear about your interface with supply chain. Yeah, I would say from a food and ag perspective related to the supply chain, I am specifically focused on addressing um, or improving upon the roughly one third of food that is wasted every year. Um, and along those lines, also improving our ability to trace the provenance of that food so we can better appreciate and value um, high quality foods. So yeah, you know, putting that in context, that third of food that goes to waste every year basically equates to greenhouse emissions that um, would be equivalent to the third largest um, country emitter behind the US and China. Um, basically food that goes to waste is grown on a land mass the size of China and still 800 million people go to, go to bed hungry every night. So really presents a massive opportunity for improvement there. Some elements we're focusing on or that we have invested in have really been in the waste mitigation category areas that improve transparency and traceability, areas that digitize, given agriculture is one of the least digitized major industries in the world, and then overall efficiency improvement opportunities, often via AI or democratization of the tools necessary to do that. Wow, lots of opportunities to, to engage there and improve uh, 
reducing that food waste and how we think about the supply chain for food. Fantastic. Uh, so the big challenges, you know, in each of your areas, uh, Pete, you mentioned a lot already. <laughs> Any of those you want to elaborate and we'll continue going around the, the Zoom. Yeah, yeah, I guess, um, well, some of the challenges, you know, I, I think I touched on it, transparency, that, that food loss is exacerbated by a lack of transparency, a lack of traceability, and over-centralization. Um, when you kind of consider that the average food item travels 1,500 miles from food, from farm to plate, um, yeah, there are we have optimized for cost efficiency, but we have not optimized for quality or resiliency. Um, so the challenge, um, one of the many we see is improving on regionalization and localization so that you can kind of reduce the distance traveled, the food wasted in the process and better incorporate some local high quality food practices. Um, to really overall connect the food system more effectively, improve resiliency, and improve um, on uh, on food quality. Yeah, we, we look at Upwards Farms as one of our portfolio companies that's doing that through vertical farming, in a way. So I think that's a that's a common uh, approach or common uh, pursuit to be able to do that. Uh, for those that can't be centralized, Alexi, we, we look at. Uh, transport, right? Getting from point A to point B. Talk to us about your biggest uh, challenge that you think you're addressing. So uh, one of the biggest challenges that we uh, stumbled upon at Nautilus really early on in the company was uh, this whole idea that aircraft specifically are not topping out on weights when they go to transport these cargo. Um, they're actually cubing out. So what we saw in since 1996 in the rise of e-commerce is the density of cargo has just dropped immensely. And so that kind of makes sense. I mean, imagine most of us have opened up an Amazon package this week and it's halfway filled with air. And so a lot of those packages are finally making their way onto air freight to help increase the delivery times to meet the expectations for consumers, essentially one to two day Amazon Prime delivery. And so most of the aircraft that are dedicated for freight right now um, just don't have the volume to actually meet the capacity that is actually uh, that they're designed for. And it's that whole mentality of, you know, designed for passengers and whatever is, uh, freight or later is kind of the saying in the industry goes. So what Nautilus has been trying to address specifically is this need for a new dedicated freighter to kind of help meet the current supply chain expectations and realities in low density. That's a great lead into packaging. Alice Murray. Yes, so I would say we have a couple of key challenges that we're facing every single day. I think the first one is about labor and we're probably all seeing that regardless of what industry we're in, so we have seen a tremendous drop in the available labor in the past few years, um, certainly accelerated by COVID. So what we've been really trying to do is more aggressively invest in automation. So AGVs, robotic arms, cartners, sorters, all types of different equipment to really help automate that entire packaging process so that we can combat the labor problem, but also so that we we can drive more capacity for our customers. So, you know, that is definitely an area that we're looking at more and more at. And it's, it's pretty challenging because everybody is sort of looking at what automation they can put in place because they're also having labor issues. So now you're running into um, the challenge of the equipment is not available because there's such huge lead time. So we're starting to see labor has caused the push for automation. The push for automation has caused the lack of availability for the automation. So that problem is kind of, you know, you know, kind of feeding off of itself. So we've got that one piece of it. And I think the other problem and challenge really that I would say that we're seeing is that there's more and more of a challenge around sustainability. So our biggest efforts around sustainability has been around controlling the process better. So doing better demand planning, having better tools for that so that when we do purchase materials, we're purchasing the right amount so we're not creating obsolete inventory. And then in a production process, we're also trying to have 
better processes, tools, and systems in place to minimize scrap and obsolescence to try and avoid that as much as possible. But Pete, when you were kind of talking about what what problem you're trying to combat when you're talking about waste, I'm thinking, gosh, is there a way from a waste perspective to use that to create different materials that are more sustainable that potentially we can put into this process so that you know we are saving from a waste perspective, but we're also, you know, leveraging waste that already exists out there. So you kind of got me thinking, you know, how can we sort of look at what you're doing and kind of think about ways to solve some of our sustainability problems too? Yeah, you know, just to touch on that last point, I mean, thank you for hitting on that. And, you know, it makes me think of our division between, you know, opportunities that are more at the root cause level and the symptomatic level. And of course, when we're talking about sustainability, the opportunity and the issue is significant enough that you pretty much need all hands on deck trying to move the ball in the right direction. So absolutely love those opportunities that are upcycling, you know, using excess product and bringing it back into the system, either in the form of another product or, you know, a reduced cost because, you know, in the case of food, it was turned away because it didn't look good. Um, so, so yeah, there's certainly opportunity in that category as well at the, at, you know, at the, um, at the source of that, trying to improve uh, incentives and the ability to value uh, important aspects of that product. I love where you're both going right there. And I'd love to kind of just go a little bit deeper and let you expound upon that a little bit more because that cost versus sustainability, it's at least up till now, it's been very much a either or. Where do you kind of see that transitioning to an, an and cost and sustainability? And how are you seeing that impact the next kind of 10 years? Well, I mean, I could start from a, a packaging perspective. I mean, we're constantly weighing, is this worth the cost? Does it make sense? But what we're starting to see is there's more technologies out there that are letting us produce differently to A, save on money, but also to, to drive more sustainable solutions too. And part of that are things like, you know, for us, packaging on demand systems where we're only producing boxes on the fly. So the packaging is the exact amount, the exact quantity, and the exact size, right? So we're leveraging tools to make sure that we do that. So I think from that perspective, we're definitely trying to do that. And I'm sure Pete has a, a completely different perspective based on your industry. <laughs> uh, yeah, don't let me jump in too much here, but you know, fair, I think, you know, really at the core of the investments we're looking at, given their regenerative nature, I think they are inherently incorporating sustainability practices. So yeah, the question for us is what is the value proposition? You know, what is the ROI on the customer uh, that the customer is actually getting from this product? So I think, you know, fortunately, again, given the inflection point that we're at in terms of the improvement in consumer demand and just tech capabilities to efficiently um, be incorporated in, 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 into the system or to produce products, we are seeing viable value propositions. Like um, I, I'm thinking of one technology um, of, of one of the companies we've invested in, clean crop technologies. So they've commercialized cold plasma technology to uh, eliminate or um, at least broadly reduce aflatoxin and uh, foodborne pathogens in food every year, roughly 10% is let, is um, lost to those causes. There are practices in place to try and address those, but this cold plasma technology uh, improves upon that by reducing incidence up to 90% um, at a cost that is up to 80% cheaper and uses 20 times less energy. Yeah, and then to, to kind of uh, go a little bit in a different direction, you talked about, you know, cost versus, uh, you know, going green. It's kind of, it feels like aviation has finally reached an inflection point where all these carbon taxes that are being uh, levied across airlines um, are actually more insurmountable than the cost of Jet A. So there's now a push more than ever to switch to these sustainable um, alternatives. The problem with the aviation industry is we're so archaic in a lot of ways and we need infrastructure. So things like hydrogen is an example, which is, you know, it seems to be like a viable alternative, but the infrastructure alone and the production of hydrogen for aviation is just not even 
close to the point of being there. And so, um, you know, then we talk about soft, um, so sustainable aviation fuel as well, but that's nowhere near the production levels that is actually usable for the industry either. So there's a huge gap as far as cost um, and sustainability still in aviation. And I think there's a lot of opportunities there to start bridging that. Do you see that some, as something that you think customers are willing to pay a little bit more of a premium for, or are we not there yet? Is it still um, really give me my cheapest flight? <laughs> yeah, that's that's the problem. So when you think about it, operating an aircraft, 65% of it is fuel. So anything you can do to kind of help reduce the cost of that is, is really crazy uh, or really important, I'm trying to say. And then obviously airlines are a margin business, three to 5%. So they live and die in fuel costs. And as an example, um, you know, well, the cost of a uh, Jet 8, per gallon right now is $5. The cost of hydrogen per gallon is 15. So that 3X price difference is just not even close to the fact that uh, I think consumers can even stomach or even shippers the cost of hydrogen. Interesting. Yeah, those are good cost metrics. What One of the things we learned actually in our last webinar, uh, which is on site, if you guys wanna go look that if you missed it, we talked about that and how those costs can be different depending upon the region in which you live in the world. And for the United States, it's not yet uh, attractive, it sounds like. Yep. Yeah. And, and, and you know, I guess one other thought in terms of addressing some of the costs or maybe excessive costs within the system, at least from a food and ag perspective, and again, going back to that transparency, um, there is just a disparate network of distribution systems and it's relatively opaque. And it's shocking how hard it is to connect some of these nodes and make it more efficient. Um, you know, there are distribution centers in Texas, for example, that may have to look to somebody in Seattle to go ahead and buy, you know, some bulk food items when they could have gone, you know, um, relatively locally. So, you know, there's the effort to, to improve on the awareness of the various elements within that network. Um, and, you know, we are seeing it in terms of, you know, some examples out there of companies. Um, well, you know, I'll be careful to, to incorporate too many shameless plugs here, but we did invest, <laughs> invest in a company by the name of Food Maven, which offers a free browser extension that food buyers can go ahead and download. Um, you know, and basically it connects all the food buyers within that network that then provides the ability to look at all of the buying opportunities through the distrib distributors that all of those food buyers are working with. So what that enables is better transparency into pricing and, um, you know, broadly thus far has reduced some of those costs up to 10%, which in a thin margin business goes a long ways. Yeah, and just to uh, add a little bit upon the, the transparency uh, part, Pete. So I spent quite a bit of time with uh, cargo airlines and customers and seeing food uh, sitting by the airplane on a hot day in Florida or California just being wasted. And you can see like salmon is an example, which is put on ice and just the ice is starting to melt. And it's just, uh, you know, the, the, the shipper actually paid for the cheapest uh, kind of way to transport the, the salmon. And so it becomes an availability. So if there's cargo availability within the passenger airplane, they put the salmon on the airplane. If not, they wait for the next airplane. And so it could sit there for days. In fact, um, you know, the whole cold chain thing uh, is, is also a huge piece of air freight. And so, uh, yeah, just food goes to waste and just inefficiencies in the way that, you know, booking is done, the way that transport is arranged and things like that. So it's a, it's a global problem on many levels. So you talk about Pete the 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 monitoring and and, and understanding where things are going and uh, Alexi, you talk about like being able to know that something sat out on the tarmac for uh, you know hours in the hot sun. Uh, Brian and I were just speaking with some folks about tracking and how that's important for uh, you know food and cold chain, but more than that. It, it, and maybe for uh, vibrational loads, if you've got like a sensitive thing or a high high value asset. Um, but beyond that, is it that big of, of a market to, to try and penetrate? And, and Alice Marie, you might have some comments when you consider how you're packaging things as well. I don't know. I mean, just in general, I mean, if you look at the, the whole supply chain for CPG products, for instance, a lot of the packaged goods, CPG. they have Oh, I'm sorry, the consumer, the consumer products, right? So they, ha they have end lives too. 
So a lot of what we need to do is make sure that we are tracking exact lots, exact distribution of products and where they're going, because we have to help ensure that things that are in front of customers um, are still viable products. And so I know that some of the things that in this industry people are looking at is some of the packaging materials. How can we have those materials tell a story too? So that if something did leave, you know, yogurt, for instance, say that that left a, you know, cold area for too long, the package would change a different color. So immediately somebody would recognize that it left the supply chain, it left that, that cold chain, and so it needs to be disposed of. So the more smart packaging that we, we can use and leverage, I think it'll help us really track that as well. So I know there's some technologies that are working on that from a, an overall um, waste perspective that will really help. And so that's why some of the things that you're talking about really make sense across, you know, all different industries because it is all connected, right? So, you know, we are packaging products to be distributed to end consumers. Those end consumers need to know that those products have, you know, been you know, care for the whole time that they're going through the supply chain. So I think that's all extremely important and it's all very connected too. And, you know, I guess I'll add one point there, you know, again, from the, the food and ag perspective and distribution network. So basically the, the small to medium sized producers and distributors make up 93% of the market there. And of them, roughly 97% still use antiquated methodologies, like just, just paper tracking and manual input. So yeah, a very ripe opportunity for improving digitization there. And you know, we invest in companies that use OCR technologies that go ahead and you know, snapshot the paper documents that are used for food safety and quality assurance and significantly improve efficiency there, which you can imagine actually finally having the ability to track that data and information, you know, it provides the ability to better track where the issues are and address the inefficiencies from that level. But what other kind of wastage does that, just, just, just those inefficiencies cost? I mean, I know probably it's actually a good one to jump to things like dunnage and things like that. So one way shipping um, to Alexi's point, empty, empty packages. Um, get sent quite a bit. What are some of the other kind of wastages that we're, we're seeing and are trying to be addressed? Well, I mean, I would say from a production process, you know, you have to be really careful that you are not creating excess scrap of materials and of products, right? So if you have a process that is not monitored correctly, does not have the right um, I would say flow to it. You could be wasting products, you could be wasting packaging materials all through a process. So I think everyone's goal is to ensure that you're doing things right the first time, right? So if we are packaging a product, we're making sure that that entire process is not only as efficient as possible, but that we have the right tools in place so that there is no waste of a product. You drop a product on the floor and it's it's um, an edible product, you have to throw it out, right? There's no just picking it up like you're at home. Like, so these processes need to be very tight. We need to have the systems in place to monitor it. So we're looking at different types of tools around like shop floor controls where it has the cameras and it's monitoring everything that occurs to make sure that there's you know credibility throughout that entire process. It's an auditable process as well. So it's very important that the more that you know, we're dealing with uh, food products, the more that we're dealing with, you know, end consumer type products, that it needs to be monitored very carefully. So the tools need to exist, the you know, systems to manage that, the data to manage that whole process and to follow it throughout the supply chain is extremely important for sure. Interesting. Yeah, and I think the other uh, wastage that is, you know, I think more apparent now than ever is looking at the Port of Los Angeles. So labor unions, things like that, and customs play a huge role in this. Um, I think that really came to the forefront over the last year. And it's also interesting, you know, not a lot of people realize when you ship, you know, things by air freight, you expect it to arrive there next day, but it takes one day for it to actually sit in customs before it uh, gets on an airplane. And then once the airplane flies, it takes one day to actually clear customs on the, the outbound side as well. So most cargo, especially air freight, you know, it travels there in 14 to 15 hours globally, but it's just 48 hours on the tarmac just going through customs. And that includes food or anything else that you can think of. Yeah, you know, I learned some uh, 
interesting data points related to the Port of Los Angeles recently. I mean, I think it's uh, right. Yeah, we're all suffering from the supply chain bottlenecks there. I understand. I mean, actually, I think the statistic I heard is broadly the U.S. throughput is less than that in Mombasa, Kenya. So basically, I mean, we are just working with an incredibly dilapidated and inefficient system at the ports. Uh, in the case of Los Angeles specifically, I think there are, you know, just just restrictions on the number of cars you can stack. You're basically li limited to two on top of each other, whereas in some other um, areas, you know, you can go up to five or six. So what does that lead to? You know, that leads to ships stuck in harbor. And then LA itself incorporated some pollution restrictions. So those ships had to be held, I think, 100 to 150 miles off coast, which again, they just kind of continued to push them farther and farther out to meet some of those requirements, but in the process, um, it, you know, increase the inefficiency as well. Interesting. Um I'm going to take one quick break here. Feel free for the, the, the folks that are on as participants to ask any questions. We've got a Q&A line that's going up. And we actually have a question on here that kind of ties two of the topics we've covered together quite nicely. And, and they're asking about kind of what do we think about the government's newish regulation um, forcing corporations to reveal their greenhouse gas emissions um, with respects to the supply chain trend. So we've kind of talked about some of the sustainability activities and some of the government regs, particularly around the ports. But just as a more macro question, how do, how do we feel the governments play into both the sustainability and the control of the supply chain or support for the supply chain come into effect with the future of supply chain? Well, I mean, we... We, we all don't like to be told what to do, right? But I mean, we are seeing more pushes, but I think a lot of organizations, including ours, have developed strategic initiatives and goals and plans in order to achieve the various, I would say, regulations and rules across the globe. So for us, I mean, DHL is a global business, so we are dealing with, you know, different uh, regulations across many different countries and territories. And it's, you know, challenging to make sure that as an organization, we can have a strategic goal around greenhouse emissions or our ESG targets and so forth that fits globally across. So, so I think that was probably the biggest challenge for us is that as an organization, we need to have a strategic goal. It needs to be something that is executable at all of the different countries and territories that we operate in, but also um, they're all different. Right, and everyone's at different points in the journey from a, an ESG first perspective, and so I would say North America is kind of behind quite a few countries too. So it does put pressure internally on different regions when you're a global organization to really push to make um, you know changes very quickly so that you can catch up to some of the other regions too. But I will say that um, many organizations, including ours, are just taking it very seriously, but there's a lot of coordination that needs to take place to ensure that strategic goals are meeting the needs of all the different you know, countries that they're dealing with. Interesting. Alice Maria, you, you are part of the World Economic Forum, right? Is, is that yes. where you do that? Does that help? Yeah, I mean, absolutely. So we, we've talked about this quite a bit in, in some of the, you know, the economic forum meetings that we've had about how to do it. And interesting to me, I have not been exposed to other countries as much in terms of what, you know, they deal with from a sustainability standpoint each day. And it is very different. So I think one of the things that um, that's really helped me see is that every single country is at a different point in a journey and has totally different goals and perceptions around sustainability. So, you know, you have to, you have to take that into consideration. Um, I've definitely learned a lot. I've definitely learned that there is much more we can do in North America to really help with the sustainability goals of, you know, the globe, but also of our individual organizations too. So, it's been very interesting to hear the different perspectives and they are all different and we are all on a different point in the journey too, for sure. Alexi, I'm curious which, uh, what your thoughts are on being able to operate globally, 6 billion LOIs. Uh, that's not all in the United States, is it? No, no, we, we operate on a global level for sure. <laughs> 
So yeah, the market in the United States is exciting, but um, yeah, the global market is even more exciting for a startup, uh, especially going after, you know, really large products and infrastructure projects such as us. Um, I think, you know, from our perspective, uh, there's always, uh, um, you know, a want in, to do something better as far as sustainability goes, but also there's an understanding that we have to pick our battles. Um, and, you know, as uh, Alice Marie said, every single country is different and on a different journey and a different point in that journey. Um, you know, in Europe, I think it's probably a little bit, you know, further down the line on that journey, which is great. So they're more meaningful. Well, they're more thoughtful about the, you know, the airplanes that they purchase. They tend to actually purchase newer airplane, airplanes because they are more technologically advanced and produce less fuel. So that actually gets, make helps us out in, in that regard. Um, but then also, you know, going back to China as an example in Asia, where it's a little bit different, um, you know, it's less of a conversation there and it's more about the conversation of price uh, per pound or how quickly and how efficiently you can transport those goods. Um, I feel that, um, you know, putting a bottleneck on doing the carbon tax for airlines is definitely going to reduce uh, capacity on aircraft. So I've heard carbon taxes being something like $120 per gallon of fuel. Well, a gallon of fuel costs $5 in certain parts of the world. So again, it's just a huge change. And it, what it will do is um, more airlines will not actually fly those aircraft, uh, helping, I think it will strain the supply chain even further. So the demand is there, but the capacity is reduced. So um, it's a very complex issue um, at a global level, as Alice Marie mentioned, but it's, it's something that I think everybody's trying to work a little bit better, but also there's also the flip side of, of this whole supply chain thing and how do we, you know, get the goods there in a timely manner. Interesting. Yeah. You know, I guess in terms of the question about what can governments do and thinking about those bottlenecks and the roles that ports play. Admittedly, we're focused a little bit more inland, given you know 15% of U.S. food supply um, comes from uh, international sources. However, obviously, it's still a significant amount. Um, now, you quantify that bottleneck. It sounds like times for delivery from um, producer to consumer have expanded from 50 days pre-pandemic to 115 days post, um, and it's not getting any better even though demand post pandemic has leveled off a little bit. Um, and, it's, and it looks like I think cost per container has gone from roughly $2,000 to $20,000. And it seems in the process that yeah, the bottleneck has shifted around to ports. And the recent infrastructure bill said that $17 billion was allocated to ports, but it's really hard to find where that actually plays out specific to those ports. So. There seems to be a tremendous opportunity to spend real money on either upgrading a port or, you know, building another, building a new one. When you think about Singapore, who spent $20 billion on a port, and Rotterdam, who basically automated their port 20 years ago to make that, um, you know, potentially autonomous, um, you know, with self-driving trucks 24-7. So I think there's a lot of improvement there and some potential for government to contribute. Huh. This sort of starts to, we got another question. Uh, Brian, can I ask this one? The, yeah, go for it. Yeah, because yeah, it, it, it's, I'll just read it. With respect to reducing waste in food and ag in space, what are the biggest hurdles holding progress back? Is it limits on tech, policy, culture, system, inertia? Um, and then they say, where should we do the most effort to drive system level change? And when, when I think about the ports, that's a pretty hard, you know, that's a pretty big system. And you talked about autonomy and, is that a place or is there a different answer or multiple answers you could? From my perspective, and I'm certainly happy to uh, hear Alexi's and Alice Marie's thoughts as, you know, admittedly, this has not been a primary focus area for us. But I mean, in terms of the question where government could participate and contribute, right, that's a big enough um, issue and opportunity that it seems like um, government dollars could do, could go a long ways in being contributed at that specific um, supply chain bottleneck opportunity. I think in terms of answering that question a little bit more broadly, well, we've touched on some of the areas we are looking at and we, I'd be happy to dig back into those, but um, I mean, also at the food and ag level, in terms of 
incentives and perhaps um, causes for excess, you got to look to the farm bill. And I mean, that's a bigger conversation and, you know, comes up for renewal regularly, but there's a lot of areas of improvement there, a lot of potential areas for improvement there too. Yeah, and to kind of echo Pete's, um, you know, we talked about transparency and the use of technology to create transparency within the supply chain. I think, you know, understanding where those pain points are and the use of technology will help al uh, alleviate some of that waste quite a bit. But when you start talking about, you know, the port of Rotterdam and the port of Los Angeles, it's almost a night and day operation. Um, you'll rarely see humans in the port of Rotterdam. Um, and, you know, here we have a human problem in the port of Los Angeles. So I think when you really dig deep down into it, the use of technology in the port of Los Angeles, I think is being um, uh, kind of held back by the unions there. And so the willingness to adopt this new technology because, um, you know, loss of jobs is an example in those key areas of, around the port. So, and that's a global problem, I think in many levels, but I think that's one thing that we can see the use of technology and automation to really reduce food waste and help accelerate the process in the supply chain. Be intrigued to kind of pivot a little bit at this point and just look a little bit at the wider picture of both, maybe it's two different questions in the same, but what are kind of the massive breakthrough technologies that are driven both by some of the governmental initiatives around sustainability, but even the wider picture? And then how much of that is impacted by some of the other competing models like the distributed manufacturing model where people are trying to buy local, build local, do things along those lines? And how does that wider picture look over the next 10 years? I mean, I would say from what we're seeing, so it, as much as people want to buy local and support local, we deal with many of the consumer product companies in, in the world and people still want products quickly and they want them inexpensively. And so there's still a huge demand for that. So I think there's some conflict that goes on on a day-to-day -day basis, right? So um, we have not seen a drop in your typical, you know, consumer product demand for packaged goods, right? And instead, we've, we've seen a huge increase in some of them, especially during COVID. And we're finding that there's actually becoming more of a shortage because there is that demand. So, you know, there's, um, you'll see it on your shelves, right? There's a shortage of products. There's a shortage of products because we can't produce it because we don't have the labor, but also because there is more consumption of those types of products too. So it's kind of a, 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 you know, a vicious cycle, right? That hasn't stopped yet, but I definitely think that people are conflicted in you know, wanting to do that, wanting to buy locally, wanting to be more sustainable, but still can't give up the convenience of having something right in front of them very fast, even though it's individually packaged and you know that it's got more waste around it, it's less expensive and it's convenient. So. I think we are we are still at, at a point where people are choosing the convenience over potentially more sustainable items or buying local and so forth. And so we just have to, you know, help the industry from a supply chain perspective handle both of those situations because they both exist out there. But definitely, um, I, you know, I see I, I still see a huge demand for the traditional way we all get our products, right? And still a huge demand for those individually wrapped products too. It's, it's, that's a really valid point. And I really like the, the, the comparison to where we're going, particularly in the consumer's goods. Are, from a food side and from a cargo side, are you still seeing the, the kind of longer tail supply chains or is there much shift away from that? And what do you think speed over locality works in, in those two markets? Yeah, you know, from a food perspective, there is, um, you know, it's moving in the right direction in appreciation for, you know, regional or more local goods. But that, that's right. I mean, it's um, it's got a long ways to go and certainly would um, be consistent with Alice Marie's comments in that regard. I think, I mean, the the understanding and desire has definitely been for those lower cost items. I think, Brian, if you were asking about, you know, what are some of the breakthrough technologies, when we've talked about some of those related to the food and ag supply chain, sure, whether it's transparency, traceability, waste mitigation, 
in a lot of ways, those are those are incremental uh, technologies, valuable and you know providing significant value propositions. But are they necessarily breakthrough? Maybe they don't fall into that category, but you know, at a, at a further end, closer to that breakthrough level. You know, I, I like the possibility of being able to actually measure the nutrient density in food items and potentially be able to price food items on that basis. In so doing, you're able to price that food item and hopefully increase the willingness and demand for that item. Um, and that's inherently going to be a little bit more local, a little bit more regional, um, hopefully given shorter um, shipping times and you know it's going to incorporate some of those better um, farming and regenerative management practices. Yeah, and I agree with uh, Alice Marie as well. I think you know I think there's a want uh, to produce more locally and you know consume locally. Um, and I think there's a there's a shift in thinking about that. I think especially on the food side of things. Um, but the reality of the world is, you know, Asia still produces most of the goods. Um, and when we look at, you know, air freight in general, it's almost unprofitable to take an airplane uh, from the United States and try to fill it up with cargo because you're not going to get a lot of export out of it to actually fly it over to Asia. So most airplanes actually fly from west to east globally. So from Asia to United States, United States to Europe, Europe to Asia, and keep going in a unidirectional type of state. And that kind of helps you think about the movement of, of goods globally. When you uh, th think about uh, maybe being able to address timeliness, um, I automatically go to uh, the availability of raw material or components that's required. Obviously, there's been a lot of discussion about chips and now potentially wheat and natural gas. When you look at the things that affect your uh, products, your, your business, Pete, the, the things that are interesting to you, in terms of across the food uh, chain, is is there if we kind of look outside, you know, orthogonal to supply main, uh, supply chain infrastructure and process, and we go, what are the things that you know that might be holding it up? Is, is there other things that oh man, if we could get this other product, that would help me out a lot because availability of that thing makes it very difficult for me, and I need to source from all the way on the other side of the world or something. Anybody have some thoughts about that? Yeah, if you're asking about, um, you know, with food and ag uh, environment specifically, there is a shortage of regeneratively grown product as well as even organic product. I mean, essentially organic is 1% of the U.S. market and regenerative is plus or minus 1% as well, depending on how you define it and how specifically people may or may, may not be incorporating similar practices. So there is significant opportunity for improvement there, but that kind of gets back to the root cause question of, you know, how do you best incentivize farmers to, to incorporate those practices? Um, and it's certainly not at the farmer level um, to be questioning, you know, the, the conventional practices that they may be using. Um, you know, it's, it's costly to transition so there are opportunities for transition financing to ease that transition, but uh, you know broadly we've come back to the full value chain in terms of needing the ability to improve that transition to regenerative practices, but at the other end, improve consumer awareness and demand for the product um, to, to increase um, that incentive and ultimate profitability to the producer. So real quickly before somebody else answers that question, but would you consider organic being sort of a subset of regenerative? Is it yeah, more right? the the other way around? Oh, um, I can say that then. Yeah, I mean you can perhaps look back at the original intention of the organic movement, you know, going back to the '60s and '70s, and along the way, organic itself got somewhat industrialized, but the original intention was a little bit more in lines with regenerative practices in terms of eliminating chemicals and pesticides, um, incorporating biodiversity through um, crop rotation and cover cropping, animal integration, and reduced tillage. Great, great. Thank you for that clarification. Um, Alison Marie or, or Alexi, is there 
uh, thoughts on raw materials or component shortages uh, that if, if we yeah, I, make it all. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I, the interesting thing, it kind of goes back to my very first challenge I mentioned, which is labor. We don't have enough people to actually produce the products, right? And so if you don't have the product, then you also don't have um, enough people to package the small products. So what we're seeing actually is that we have less feeder stock and that feeder stock could be any type of product from you know any industry, right? It could be a food product, it could you know be something else, but we just have less of it because there is not enough labor to produce it. So we're actually seeing the cause of some of our issues, not necessarily because of the raw material, but because there's a lack of labor to produce the product. And so that gives us you know, less feeder stock, and less feeder stock to package. So it's affecting the entire supply chain. And I think it goes back to why everyone is looking to do more automation in some of these manufacturing facilities, because that labor shortage is causing a lack of product shortage, right? And so we need to stop that. And I think the next challenge that we're starting to all see is that we have to upskill the existing labor that we do have in order to use the new automation and the new equipment. And so that's kind of where I think people are shifting in order to, you know, basically solve the problem of we don't have the feeder stock to even get to the market. And so there's definitely, um, it all goes to me, it's kind of all going back to labor. And there's definitely a way that, uh, we can combat that, which is through all of the automation. But in order to use the automation, you also have to have um, an upskill of the labor workforce that you had in the first place. So there's there's a whole separate set of challenges that are going on around that. So yeah, and then um, bring a little bit of labor back into what we're doing. So you know, one of the challenges that I think the air freight industry as a whole is having is lack of pilots. And so when you think about what Nautilus is working on, which is of course autonomy for these large scale um, freighters is autonomy is not there to reduce the cost for the airline. It's uh, autonomy is there to help uh, create the demand or the, the ability to actually fly the routes that the that this supply and demand equation is trying to get at. Uh, specifically, the problem is, you know, really hampered in Asia where, uh, you know, air, flight, air freights and then air passenger flights are doubling um, quite quickly. And then of course, now we have the, the whole trend with urban air mobility, which has got a demand for 13,000 pilots. I think that's uh, 30 to 40% of the United States pilot workforce. Uh, so it's just, you start to see, you know, large problems within the labor side as well. And when, you know, I think the, the public idea of, of an autonomous aircraft or uh, no pilot in the cockpit, I think is still very far away, but for a freighter or uh, cargo, I think it starts to make a lot of sense. So. I think we're helping answer with, with a lot of the technology that we're working on right now, that labor shortage as well. Great. Um, one of the questions that I wanted to ask, we're starting right out of time, is uh, metrics. Like, what do we measure to tell us uh, where the pain points are and to give us the data that says this is the right pain point to focus on and this is the metric I need to change with technology. So I'd love to hear any thoughts that you guys have on metrics that you think are super important for us to be um, focused on. And I'll, I'll, I'll kick this question off with Pete because we actually had somebody ask, um, you know, going back to your comment about nutrient density, mm. like how would you measure that? What kind of tech is gonna be required for that? And in a cost-effective way. Yeah, I guess, um... Maybe I'm thinking about that in terms of um, as somewhat two different questions in, in terms of measuring nutrient density. Um, there are companies out there developing devices that can be incorporated at the producer level that can read that nutrient density and articulate that effectively. They're not on market yet, but they do provide hope in that regard that that can be done effectively um both to, both at a measurement and at a cost level um you know in terms of measuring impact for us you know being a fund we're considering doing it at a portfolio level um you know and boy you know up front i'll say that we have um looked to a few consultants to get some quotes on that recently and um you know sometimes when you see some of those quotes uh it makes me feel like i'm in the wrong business they um they are quite expensive and it kind of points to the um understanding that a lot of 
funds like ourselves are looking for a little bit more efficient and standardized ways to measure those outcomes. So thus far, just given the nature of the investments and inherent regenerative components, um, we are focusing on specific outcomes for those companies. You know, I think we've touched on a couple of them. If it's waste mitigation, it's, you know, how much food loss is saved. If it's, um, you know, transport related, we can, or, or waste related, we can also go ahead and take a look at, you know, how many greenhouse gas emissions were reduced along those lines as well. So those are some of the examples, but it's still a challenge to do so broadly on a standardized way. And I just think from a, a packaging perspective, we are a metrics based organization. So every point in that supply chain, we have some metrics, whether it is metrics around scrap waste, obsolescence, or metrics around capacity and, and, and how much that we can add, or metrics around just the quality, right? Because that drives, you know, cost, um, it drives the ability to get products out the door quickly and so forth. So I think there's so many different things from a metrics perspective that we have to look at from a supply chain organization and we do look at it. But I would say always the most important metric that we have is safety. And it's safety around our employees, it's safety around that labor. So one, we wanna get the labor in the door, which we're, we're working on that challenge. But two, once they're in the door, the most important thing to do is to make sure that that environment is 100% safe for them. And I think that is the one that we look at every single day and we track across every single operation that we have. That's great. And I guess uh, from the air freight perspective or the transport side, um, the, there's only one metric that the, you know, the industry uses and it's uh, freight ton kilometer. So the cost of transport one freight ton, one kilometer. Mm -hmm. And it's such a basic rudimentary uh, metric that it doesn't really tell you a lot of anything. So when you look at trucking as an example, or rail or ocean or air, you see all these changes and everything, but you know, a truck might take 20 hours to get there where an airplane might be an hour and a half. And so, I think the, the idea of including time in that instead of kilometers is, uh, I think, the, something that needs to be changed. But the industry is so behind on a lot of these uh, metrics that, um, I don't know, just even getting the data to get something like that going is, um, I don't know, it'll be very challenging. Well, we have a couple minutes left. Brian, you got one more question for everybody? I was just kind of going along with where you're at the metrics. So if you take those metrics forward, what do you, if you could have a one or two sentence wish for the next 10 years in your field, what, what would it be? What was the next massive breakthrough that you're excited about? Oh gosh, there's so many things that, you know, we're looking at and so forth. I think a lot of ours is around, you know, robotics and being able to leverage them, but more in a plug and play world, right? So you could just kind of come in and they can all be collaborative and work with all different technologies without so much effort. So that's what I would really, you know, get excited about um, and being able to you know, put in more of the robotics and technologies like that without a tremendous amount of integration work that has to go on like we have today. Interesting. Lots, lots going on in that space. <laughs> yeah. Pete, how about you? Yeah, you know, I think I, I shared my hope um, in terms of just the ability to price food based on nutrient density. I think that could go a long way in ensuring better growing practices, more efficient transport, um, ultimately encouraging regionalization and localization. Um, so, so, yeah, there are um, many areas that need to address, but if we got to pick one, I think that has a lot of potential in terms of uh, placing value where it needs to be placed. Love it. Better health off the back of that too. Lexi, how about you? Uh, you know, just uh, the Iron Man energy source, I guess, is what I'm really wishful uh, for. So, you know, if we can put that on an airplane and reduce the cost of fuel to almost zero, heck, you know, I think that'll be the biggest breakthrough ever. Um, but if we can't get that to work, um, I think hydrogen is probably the next best step in aviation. So uh, looking probably, you know, 20 to 30 years, unfortunately, for that to become really viable on a global level, but it's something that we're very excited about. Awesome, well, thanks for sharing that. All right, well, that, that's a wrap, we're out of time. Thank you so much to all of our panelists and for you guys for joining us and listening in and participating in our conversation with questions and great comments.
Until next time. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Bye-bye.